Okay. So getting into the formal part of this evening, this is the CPA exam prep webinar, and I want to take you through some tips and tricks that I've uh, learned over the last 17 years. So uh, the chat box is ready to go, so feel free to use it. But sometimes I'm going to say, hold on a sec, I'll come back and answer that question in a minute. So for example, scaled scores, I'm going to give you the scaled score equivalent of our practice exam to the CPA exam it's for every subject, but I'm doing that at the end of the session. So I have been a, I started marking CPA exams in about 2001 for CPA and started teaching the CPA program in 2001 as well. So I was a chief examiner for, a, for over 20 semesters. Uh, across reporting professional practice, corporate governance, which became ethics and governance, and strategic management accounting. Also one of the examiners for contemporary business issues and global strategy and leadership. So I've seen thousands and thousands of CPA uh, student exams. I've marked thousands and thousands of them. And what I want to talk to you is the biggest mistakes I've seen, because when I say a mistake, I don't mean you move from a credit to a pass or a distinction to a credit. I mean you fail the exam. And the number one mistake by, by a clear distance is for the core subjects running out of time. So we open as examiners, we open the papers and the answers are blank. And there's a student who spent all of their time trying to get every multiple choice question right and therefore got zero on the written. And, and that's just a catastrophic failure. You have to, because, because in, you know, in ethics and governance and SMA, it's worth 25 marks out of 85. If you don't write anything, your chance of success is so low. So you must be disciplined. At the two hour mark, you must jump across, read that case, get some words down. Even if you write a few paragraphs per question, that's it. You're gonna earn some marks, five, eight, 10, 20. That's the, that's the aim. But don't write nothing because uh, you, it's, it's just so difficult. And, and the reality is with the written, if you write nothing, you get zero. With MCQs, if you're running out of time, at least you can guess the last 10. So please, please, please have your watch, plan your time, and you must say to yourself, I must get on to the next uh, question and to the my written. We've already noticed this with our practice exams. A good portion of people aren't able to complete the written section, and in, in GSL especially, that's a real problem. Uh, are the written sections in a separate section uh, for CPA? Uh, in our in our exam, they're just at the bottom of the list, so you can scroll down and do them. Um, same as CPA, you just click through and you can and do them then. So they're in the same area, but you've got to click through. And you don't have to do them first, although I do recommend that sometimes, but please be careful. So the second thing is running out of time to do the MCQs. There is a, a real mindset of, I'm reading a question, I must work on this question till I get it right. That is not going to work. You, you have two minutes or three minutes per multiple choice, depending on your subject, and I'll show those later. But what we have is people will spend five or 10 minutes because they hate getting an answer wrong. So they're looking through the study guide and they're checking and testing. The problem with that, you then miss out on reading other questions that you do know the answer to. So if you don't know an answer, don't waste three, four, five minutes looking for it and maybe still getting it wrong. You have to jump. You have to move to the next one. Now, a lot of students say, oh, I'll try that, but they don't. And, they, and then they, they fail because they miss out on getting to the end. So with the financial reporting, they don't normally tell you how many questions there are. They just tell you there's 20 marks available. So the third problem I, I see a lot of, yeah, someone's just written flag them and go back to them later. That is the best answer. So, so I did the CPA exams when it was paper. And what I would do is, if I didn't know a question, I put a question mark on that one and then straight away to the next. And I got right to the end of the paper, marked all the ones I knew, and then went back and attacked the question marks. And like, let's say there's 10 out of 60 I really didn't know. And I, I only did that in my spare time. And when I did the tax exam, for example, there were about six questions I just couldn't figure out out of 60. So I just had to guess. But, but at least I'd worked to the end of the paper and then went back. So the next uh, two, uh, the, we're seeing this already with the, the written responses, but sometimes multiple choice. You have to, which of the following is the best or the most likely? Now, some people don't like that. It's quite ambiguous, but you must read what the question is asking because they have these things in the multiple choice called distractors. Every option is designed to distract you from the correct answer. 
So have to be really, really careful. No, there, there is no reading time. You have three hours and 15 minutes and, and that's pretty much it. Yeah, if you hate those one and three or one and two, uh, that's just how it works. It's hard to underline. Uh, sometimes you can just type notes into the screen. So please read the, care, the questions really carefully. Uh, we'll talk about scaled scores at the end of um, the session. CPA don't publish how many marks it takes to pass your exam. They just use a scaling system. And the biggest issue on, on top of it, these are inside your exam, but the reality is if you haven't done enough preparation, it's really hard to make it through. And we see, I'm marking ethics and governance papers. Sometimes people are answering a module four question with module two knowledge. It, you're like, oh, you've used the wrong tool or the wrong technique, you're, you're a bit confused. So if you haven't done the reading, um, my, my big advice, you've got till next Friday to defer. If you're, if you're guaranteed a, a fail kind of thing because you've only made it to module two of seven, for example, then please don't, don't think of it as giving up if you defer because you've run out of time because of work or other pressures. Um, I'll show you our scaled scores um, and if you, you can then see if you're on track for a pass or not. Okay, so that's the, the first key points. So if you've got any questions on those, I mean, I'll just go through the chat box and uh, you can have a think about when exam preparation starts. Uh, I reckon I've answered everything, that's fantastic. Now one thing to note, I've just heard some lightning and thunder, I'm in Melbourne, it's been sunny all day and there's a storm that's just come in, so if I do disappear, uh, then, then that's a storm and I do apologise, it's just one of those days. So exam prep starts at the start of semester. We, we push very hard, book your exam, make a pledge, do your study plans, but now that's the now we're up to the point where we can um, try and figure out how to do really really well this semester. So what we've got here is uh, yeah, yeah lucky hey with the storm going at the moment. I'll just increase my my volume. Uh, just a lot of rain on the roof. <laughs> what a day! All right, so. We need to get your timing and pacing as effective as possible during the exam and skipping ahead, which I've already mentioned. Then using your index and summary notes carefully. So what do we do here? Practice exams. That's the absolute critical thing. Do the practice exam to practice your timing, watching how long you take to do an MCQ, seeing how long it takes you to type an answer. Lift your typing skills if you can. So. Uh, Someone asked a few people, what's the pass mark? Now, I'm going to tell you ethics and governance now and the other ones later on in the session. But the practice exam is out of 85 marks for ethics and governance. And we emailed this out the other day. But if you didn't see it, here we go. If this is where you're scoring, you've got to do quite a lot more work to lift your results. Uh, if you're moving into this area, you can be a little bit more relaxed, but keep aiming as high as possible. So this is what I mean with our scaled score comparison to the CPA results. So we don't know the actual CPA pass mark, but we can tell you what to expect based on these items. Now, some people who get below 37, they do pass or get a credit or a distinction, okay? Um, so I'm not saying it's guaranteed, but just be careful. Most people here do get a high pass or credit, but sometimes people don't make it through. So we have to be careful not to guarantee it to you but to give you good feedback. Uh, the pass mark is the total. There is no section pass mark. CPA do not differentiate between written and MCQ. Uh, great. All right, so in boot camp, uh, which we ran about a week or so ago, I talked about how to learn, which goes beyond reading. We gave out a 10 day study revision plan and we talked about how to revise and touched on exam technique and finally sit or defer. So tonight's topics take it more towards the exam technique situation. And that's where we're up to now. So my agenda, guessing the exam uh, question, deconstruction, written answers, exam technique, and final preparation. Yeah, there is going to be some echo because there's some serious storm activity happening. Uh, so if my microphone's a bit too high, I'll, I'll try and adjust it so it works really well. But there's, there's a huge storm beating down on the roof. Uh, for response questions, I'm going to talk about the technique uh, after the MCQ. So that's in about five minutes. So the first thing, I, this is, I started doing this in 2001 with my students. 
And what we uh, what we did is we went through the study guide and we said, let's try and guess the exam questions. Like by just looking at the modules and what do we think the most important areas are, what, what looks critical, what could be turned into an MCQ. And we were very, very accurate. So 70, 80% of the questions we were able to sort of estimate. So the first thing we looked at is the module weightings followed by the module objectives. From there, we have to ask the question, can it be a multiple choice question? Some things are too general or vague or not properly explained to be an MCQ. And that's this idea of is it fluff or is it important? Sometimes there's a couple of pages explaining a concept, but the, the key concept might only be in one paragraph. So let's talk about module weightings first. This, I've grabbed this from financial risk management, so if you're studying that, here we go. You have a very clear indication from CPA of what to expect on your exam. You're going to get 70 questions, and for modules one, three, and four, they're all worth 10%. Now, it's not 100% locked in that you'll get seven questions. You might get five or six or eight or nine, but you should get about seven questions on these modules, and for all the others, they're worth 14%, which works out to about 20, 10 questions each. So you can figure out where to devote the most amount of time in your study and what to expect next. Uh, so someone's, uh, someone said study guide has case study at the end and that's strategic management accounting. Will questions in the, included in the exam? No, I'll show you in about one slide. So the previous one was financial risk management. The same thing happens with contemporary business issues. Now have a look at this. Make sure you focus on the modules that are most critical. A lot of the time in tax, module one's only worth a couple of percent. In management accounting, it's only worth 10%. But when people start studying and revising, that's where they, they start and they put their attention. Try and put your attention where the weightings are. So here's management accounting, and someone's asked, uh, will there be any questions on the case study? And the answer is no, but you should still study it because it's like a practice exam. Uh, some, some said the module weighting was a bit misleading. Yeah, it, a good CPA exam should match the weighting. And if you look at management accounting, look at this. 30% of your exam is linked to module four. So you have to perform well here to get through. Because CPA use up to six exams per subject to make sure like people aren't cheating and sharing all the questions, they have different questions. So sometimes I think they don't get the weighting exactly right. Yeah, module five of FR, 24%. It's terrifying. You, you know, you look at SMA, or even if you're doing ethics and governance, module three and four together, 50%, 60% of your paper. So yeah, you, there's some modules you've got to do extremely well. Um, thanks for that tip on taking discount rate tables into the exam and you can download those from our site. Um, yeah, so you might, some people would say, oh, I didn't get a net present value question. I would go, oh yeah, I got a massive one. That's what we mean about you get, you'd have no idea what to expect on your paper as it comes through. So module weightings are the clearest guide to web study. Then we have module objectives. And this is where you've got to look at, here's uh, SMA module three, for example. Module three has seven objectives, right? And it's on performance measurement and heaps of students don't like uh, SMA module three because it's kind of theoretical and quite confusing. So uh, what we've got here for SMA, 85 marks, um, I'm noticing a bit of chat on who's doing the AAA exam. I'm going to leave the chat box open at the end of the webinar, so happy for you to do that chat then. But if you could avoid, let, let's stay on the topic, otherwise um, people will get distracted by the chat box if it's off topic. So SMA has 85 marks. Module three is worth 20%. So when I was telling you we, I got my students in the classroom, we guessed all of the exam questions. This is what we did. said, so, right, if I was going to allocate 17 marks, which is 20% of an 85 mark exam, across these seven objectives, how would I do it? Where would I put the most emphasis? And you know, so you might say, well, at least two, if not three questions are going to appear in each of these uh, areas as we go along. So this is how you can guess where you get the exam questions. And then you say to yourself, do I know how to evaluate performance measures? Do I know about SMART? Do I know about validity and reliability and timeliness and clarity? That's how we check. If it's tax, you can, if it says, you know, calculate these areas, FBT or GST, you can check and test and see if you are ready for your exam. 
So the next point is, can it be an MCQ? And this is where we look for things like dot points and headings and say, any anytime the study guide discusses four points, that's a perfect multiple choice type situation. And uh, here's an example from Ethics and Governance Module 5. It talks about four drivers of change. Great, because then they can ask a question like, which of the following is not a driver? They might list three. Or which of the following drivers is most relevant to X, Y, and Z case study? So to conclude this area, guess the question, which means go through all of those objectives. Now, sometimes people, they get to the start of a module and they just flip past that because that's the boring stuff, the administration stuff. But that's where the examiners look to pick the question. So when I used to write the CPA exam questions, I would go to the module, go to the module waiting, I would then go to the objectives and make sure my questions match the objectives in a systematic manner. So now deconstruction, what does this mean? Uh, as you do deconstruction, I want you to think of cake. So every time you think of cake, you'll see, think about your CPA exam and you'll be totally ready. What we want you to be able to do is pull apart a multiple choice question so that you don't make silly mistakes. A, a good multiple choice question. Some people say to you, oh, the CPA, that's not a real accounting thing. Only be a chartered accountant because we do uh, multiple choice questions as if all multiple choice questions are really easy. But every option, A, B, C, D, is designed to distract you. So it's got to be plausible. It's got to be close to what looks right. So that might be correct, but not the most correct, which a lot of people hate. So the CPA exam goes beyond just finding stuff in the study guide. And it's about application. It's about things like calculation, interpreting, making recommendations. So it's more than just here are some case facts. Uh, an example I'll use from management accounting or global strategy. Porter talks about different competitive strategies, cost leadership, differentiation, focus, cost, cost focus, differentiation, focus. Now, you won't get a theory question saying, what is the definition, eh, definition of cost leadership? What you'll get is a, a case study about a company, and then you'll have to decide what strategy they are pursuing. All right, um, if I could ask, hold up on the AAA discussion just for now. There'll be chat later on, but because there's people across every subject, so it'll be um, distracting. So if we're going to do construct an MCQ, what are the different types? There are simple find ones. And if you get this, celebrate. They're nice, they're easy, but there's not very many. So what we've got is go and find this page and which of the following four items is not listed. Now, most a good CPA exam will have zero of these, but you might get three or four or five. So um, uh, I'm just going to pause the chat box just for a sec. I'll um, we'll we'll do a little bit more. Uh, I'll, at, at each point that I get to the end of, I'll say um, ask your questions, and that way we'll we'll get through, and everyone still gets to ask their questions. So here is an example of a find question. I have grabbed this from Ethics and Governance. So all of you should remember this, even if you're not studying it this semester. So which of the following is not, so straight away it's a slightly trickier question because people misread that. They're in a hurry, they're under pressure, the clock is ticking, and they read which of the following is an attribute. And it's not even spelled correctly, is not an attribute. So what we have is four that look plausible, but we have to be able to find the answer. Now this is quite a simple question because three of these items can be found in a dot point situation. So it's just, even if you don't understand the study guide, even if you've never studied this subject, you will get this answer right. So it's very easy, but you won't get very many find questions. The next is, do you even understand? Can you um, clearly know what's going on? So this is when it's defined or described in a separate way. And once again, Ethics Governance Module 1. So uh, if you want to uh, use the chat box, I'll, I'll, if you remember this, you can give it a go. We did this in the first week, but which of the following describes this view? So we've given a scenario and then you need to choose which one is correct. So it's about understanding. OK, so we talked about public interest, but really it's about wealth and status. And most people who just studied it will go, that's the market control view, which is linked to the idea of capturing monopoly. But it is definitely not traditional, definitely not uh, functional. So that's that's more of an understanding question. So here's a bit of an explanation. This is comprehending or understanding. 
these are the reasons why they don't fit, but this is the, the explanation. So a slightly trickier question. Explaining is normally linked to the written responses. Uh, but what you have to do is, it's not enough to just memorize, you have to be able to explain it to someone, make them know what it means in a way that, that is clear. So going back to the end of uh, part B of module one of ethics, why have we got reduced credibility in the accounting profession? And what are two approaches that might help? So we have to go beyond just ticking a box and actually being able to explain this more clearly. So you can see the level of difficulty is, has jumped up. Another example, we've got an agency. Explain the potential agency costs that arises. Now, in module three, we have agency costs, monitoring, bonding, residual loss, but that's definitions. Here we actually have to look at a case study and then not only define the costs that have happened, but make recommendations about approaches that would fix. Um, the way this could be asked in a multiple choice question is they could describe in the options a particular approach. And you might have to say, which approach is most effective at solving this particular problem? So it's not enough to just know the theory, you have to be able to solve the problem. So the distractors, the options A, B, C, D can be quite long and complicated. Then we get to application. And this is uh, often linked to calculation or using tools from the study guide. So if you're doing global strategy and leadership, you would have seen the power interest grid. You would have seen ANSOFT's matrix. Uh, yeah, you get to use professional judgment, definitely. Uh, so use ANSOFT's matrix. You will use Cotter's eight steps. If you're in SMA, you will use the checklist for validity and clarity and, and SMART, you know, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant timeframe. So application in a written response, here, here's one for, um, anyone saying Enron, it was an absolute disaster of a structure. So your job is to just apply, read case facts, and then find out where the problems are. So this person is corrupted because they've been given a consulting contract to make them be obedient. This one is corrupted, they were given undisclosed payments. This one's corrupted because their spouse got given a corrupt payment. And this one was regarded as being too old and not having enough mental capacity to do a decent job. So application means take the FRC code, hold it up, and then the key points are things like uh, the lack of independence and not related uh, party interests and lack of uh, control of, of behavior. So you've got to act in the best interest of the company, not with conflict of interest. So that's an apply. Another example would be, here's a set of case facts. It's an advertisement. Is it breaching the law? Well, the only way to answer this question is to be able to look at the law. So you've got to know what the law is. Then you have to be able to look at the uh, case facts and then come to a conclusion. So you can see this is a much lever, greater level of difficulty. Now, this can still be a multiple choice question. I could, uh, if this was the question, I would say, this is an example of unconscionable conduct, or this is misleading and deceptive, so it's a breach of X, Y, Z or this is an example of puffery, so it doesn't count. So these are the different structures that you can be in multiple choice or written answer application. So uh, from the next one, calculate. And if you're financial reporting, management accounting, financial risk management uh, and tax, this is where you're going to get types of questions. So you can have to, you know, figure out the selling price variable, price, uh, variable cost, can you calculate a return on investment, a contribution margin, a break-even point, whatever it is, calculate. So you've got to use those formulas quickly. So you, you can't wait till the exam to use a formula. You have to be practicing several weeks before your exam. And what I say here is these then, the information from your calculation then becomes more of the story. So you can, from this, calculate, is this business going to be profitable or is it in significant difficulty? Here's a, another example that Tiashin uses in financial reporting. We've got Matthew, mobile contract, pays $100 for 12 months. This is what's going on. What is the transaction price? What is the revenue? When will the revenue be recognized? So we're going through this idea of application where you can't just know the, the theory, you have to be able to apply it to a specific set of case facts. 
here's another uh, example of showing the, the calculation. So you've got your selling price, percent uh, situation, allocation as we work through. So you need to be able to apply knowledge quickly and confidently. So if you're in management accounting, things like net present value calculations, break even calculations, financial risk management, you've got to be able to do those items as well. Oh, that last one was FR. I'm jumping across different subjects because we've got people in different groups. So solve. I love solve questions, but these are the ones that you will make extre uh, find extremely difficult. Solve is when you are given a problem, but no immediate answer. You don't just say, oh, that is X or Y or Z. It's not a classification problem. It's a, what would you do to fix this? Now, management accounting, it might be a cost blowout. How do you fix it? It might be problems with your customers or how to redesign your value chain in global strategy and leadership. It might be recommending options for growth or fixing the business or for improving leadership style. So as we solve, we have to not just apply knowledge, but figure it out, something that's never been thought of before. And that's, the, that's what an accounting professional does. They're not just a computer or a robot that takes transactions and processes them. They look at new issues and problems. And they, someone posted it earlier, professional judgment to figure out how to fix the situation and the problem. And, and what this, you might notice, now all of a sudden, every week we send you pre-webinar questions and we ask you to work on those. And you can see we're trying to move you from just learning the study guide to practicing, applying. And here's one I think that the Ashton used in audit. It looks a little bit financial funding, but audit, here we go. So we're looking at testing and existence and making sure things that have taken place. So identify a misstatement. What's a risk? What's the assertion? How will you gather evidence? How would you efficiently test? So what we've got is not just questions of theory, but how would you apply it to a specific set of case facts? So that way you're more prepared and ready to go. So that's how the types of questions that you can expect. Now, as CPA examiners, our task was to write as many questions in this category as possible because that's the harder. They prove that you as an accountant know your stuff. If we give you a fine question, it's it's pretty rubbish. It's a bit too easy. This is better. This is better again. But this is the critical and difficult areas. And that's why in your CPA exams, you often go, whoa, that was pretty tough. Here's another example of a solve situation. Earlier on, I showed you the question about Enron. Identifying areas is this idea of hold up the, the good practice and compare it, okay? So that's an identify and apply, but recommend improvements is a soul. This is where you've got to use your judgment, your skill and your knowledge to fix the problem. All right, any any questions on that? I'll, um, I, don't, I think I've captured everything in the, the chat box so far. <coughs> oh, someone wrote, uh, the multiple choice questions were easier than you thought. Uh, it depends on your subject. If you're doing ethics and governance, the first exam is a little bit easier because we put them in module order. Um, but the other thing is, we it's there. It's okay to have an easier exam. It's just the pass mark is higher. A lot of people think that 50% is the pass mark. That is not the case. You have to get plenty more questions than that, right? For GSL, we don't have a scale score yet, but I'll chat about those in uh, future. Uh, the multiple choice in your CPA exam will be scrambled. They won't be in order. And everyone, you should get scrambled questions except for ethics and governance exam one. We scramble it later on. So an FR application solve part of the calculation. Yeah, so I, I would even say that's a little bit more closely linked to, let me just go back to the calculate. If it's a pure calculation, that, that's pretty much what it is, unless you have to apply and cleverly choose between different accounting standards, then it will be sold. Uh, yeah, so Vivian said, are the practice exams to prepare not easy or hard? It's, it's tricky here. So for example, our tax exam is very hard. Our CBI exam, our ethics exam are a little bit easier, but you should you need to get sort of 70% to be doing well. So we, we try and match the CPA exams, but they have different exams for, they have five or six exams. So some people will walk out of our ethics and governance exam and say that was much tougher than the CPA one. 
and someone else will say it was much easier. So it really depends on the exam you get. Yes, we'll be resetting the exams. We're doing that. It's going to take quite a few hours tonight or tomorrow morning as we, we solve that. Someone's just mentioned because we had some exam issues on our website earlier today. Uh, when is the last day you can do the practice exam? You can do it right up until the day of your um, exam. We even had someone do it on the day of their exam, which is a bit interesting because they would be exhausted. They did three and a quarter hours of our stuff plus reading the solutions and then the CPA exam. Not much time to learn from that, but if that's what you want to do, you're welcome. If you need it marked, it takes four business days to mark the written section. Yeah, watch for double negative wording. That's, that's very unfair and it shouldn't happen, but it does. All right, so uh, I'm getting to the written answers now because a few people have asked about that. How the case study examined? That's a, a good long question. And I'll, I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, case studies can be examined in written answer or multiple choice. So if you've done a thorough reading on the exam day itself, you don't need to spend as much time to analyze them on the day itself. Uh, there's no case studies anymore that you get in advance. In global strategy, you used to get it in advance, but not anymore. Uh, how CPA will balance tough exam against easy exam. What they do, in every CPA exam, there'll be a cohort of questions that say half the questions are the same. And so if the average on one exam is higher than the other, they will know that that was an easier exam than that one. And then they adjust the scale score so that they are equally weighted. So it's, it's pretty fair. They, they do a very thorough job. Uh, will the practice exams give marks as soon as you finish? Yes, they do. Uh, for your multiple choice instantly, and you can review your written answers. So written answers. Don't get too caught up in, well, how do I do this? Is it too tricky? There is a very systematic approach. I'm going to start with ethics and governance because this approach actually applies everywhere. Now, from university, you should have heard of the IRAC method. It's, it can have different names, but IRAC issue. What is the issue? What am I talking about here? What is the law? What is the application of the law to the case facts? And what is my conclusion? Now, it doesn't have to be a law question. It could be an ethics question. And then you would say, what is the issue? What is the relevant ethical principles? How do I apply those principles to this case and then come to a conclusion? Now, if it's a management accounting question, it might be linked to profitability or should I do this project? Great. The issue is, should I do this project? Then what is the relevant, not law, in management accounting, what is the relevant calculations and analysis? So it might be net present value or residual value or analysis. So I need to determine this project. My calculations are here. So I apply it to the case facts and then I say approve this project or reject this project or get rid of this customer or solve this problem. Yep, so ILAC, excellent. IRAC, exactly the same. <coughs> um, it's a great, yeah, we actually do have, I reckon we do have a blog post on the scale score rather than a video, but I do agree that we should, we should turn that into a video and um, explain it further. So if you can answer a legal question, you can ask, answer an ethical question, a financial reporting question, and a global strategy and leadership question. Now, I've already marked, uh, I think well over 100 people have done the ethics and governance exam, which is fantastic, and I've, they've been marked in return. But one of the things I'm noticing is one of the law questions, a lot of students are just doing this. They just say, this is a breach of the law. Oh, OK, how did you determine that? You can't just make a statement. You have to go back and say, what is the issue? What is the law? What case facts justify your decision? So you get the answer right, but you miss out on heaps of marks if, um, if you do that. So SMA, yeah, you, you do the same thing. What's the issue? What are the calculations I need to, what analysis? Uh, and then look at the case, come to the conclusion. So I hope that, what, and what is interesting, so we used to mark papers and everyone wants, oh, do I have to write two or three pages? Absolutely not. Uh, in most ethics and, and governance questions, um, two or three paragraphs more than easily covers the, the situation. Even a seven-step uh, AAA model, American Accounting Association ethical model, it might be a maximum of half a page to three quarters of a page, depending on, on what you write. If, if you address the question immediately, so for example, a law question will just be one line. The relevant law is going to be three lines. Applying is going to take a paragraph or two, coming to a conclusion, another three or four lines. So you, you don't have to write much. It's about systematic, clear structure that covers off on all the points. 
Uh, can you use dot points? I'll talk about that in a minute. But yes, you're not, what I'm noticing, we dot points are permitted, no problem. But I'm finding with the dot point answers I'm getting, it, they're not answering the question. The question will be identify and explain. And people will just write a quick dot point list. That will get you a couple of marks, but there's no explanation. So what we want to do here is make sure that you identify and then discuss further. Write more. And, and Russell's been busy marking some management account exams and his number one piece of feedback is write more in your answers, not very much. So, and I'll talk a little bit more about those, that the length in just a second. All right, so what we've got here, the AAA model is an example. So if you've got an ethics question, you can see, how do I do a written answer? The answer is like this, list the facts, the issues, the principles and norms, the alternatives, the norms, the consequences, and come to a conclusion. There is a clear structure already given to you in the study guide for the types of questions you get. So to explain calculations, you just have to type them out line by line. So you're only going to really come across those in management accounting. Uh, financial reporting, you might have to do them as well. You might have to type a journal entry or some numbers, but you just write step one, step two, step three. Just make it clear for your examiner. Here's another framework in, from ethics and governance, four steps to dealing with an ethical issue. So just write step one, two, three, four. I, I'm always surprised at how people just jump to the conclusion, but don't write the steps. You have to assume that the examiner doesn't know anything about the case facts. So what, what I'll sometimes see in an answer, uh, the benefits are greater than harms to oneself as shown in the case facts. And it's like, you can't write that. That's worth zero marks. You have to say, based on this bit of information from the case facts, you have to put the case facts in to prove your point. You have to justify your position. The examiner will not give you marks for, if you just say, it was in the case, or this is illegal because they broke the law. You have to say what law it was and which part of the information was the breach of the law. So, um, yeah, yeah, you might think that the, the examiner will read it above. And, and it's this is, I, I've typed this in a few people's comments. You might have got it from me. I know you know the answer, but I can't give you all the marks. So I say, I know you understand this material, well done, but you haven't earned the full marks because you haven't um, shown me. So <coughs> um, with, the, with the ethics and governance one, the, it's a governance-based question rather than a law-based question, but it's the second question in that paper. I don't want to go into too much detail for those who haven't studied it yet, but that one you can still use IRAC. What is the issue? So you just go issue one and, and description, issue two, description, issue three, and then the recommendations are how to solve. So, so that's a solve um, situation taking place there. Yeah, so sometimes people go uh, the, um, with the, sorry, with the practice exam and going, <laughs> I've lost my train of thought. I'm sorry if the website's down. Um, I'll, I'll, I can't deal with that right now. So what we've got is, explaining um, to the examiner, often people read the case, it's in their mind, they know the examiner knows it, and so they skip, they skip, and they skip. And you can often get a high distinction student only getting a pass mark as a result. So dot points, can you do them? Definitely, but they're risky because most people only identify rather than explain. So. Uh, long essays, some people write and write and write, like they go, oh, I've written the answer, but just in case, here's a bit more, and just in case, here's a bit more. And that's guaranteed to lose you marks because it looks like you're just putting everything on the paper because you don't really know what you're writing. Kind of, we call it the splatter gun approach, just hoping something is right. And, and that often gets ignored and treated as lack of understanding. So long essays are very costly. So not too short, not too long, Balance, just right, just communicate the key items. So yeah, yeah, it does. It shows the examiner that you're, you're guessing. So for example, if you're asked which director's duty is breached and you just list all the director's duties, then the examiner is instructed to give you zero because you're, it looks like you're guessing. You have to choose one or two if that's what they ask you for. Uh, GSL exam prep, I'll, I'll be talking about GSL in, in just a minute. 
uh, someone's just written, yeah, in the EEG, it's, in, information is often redundant. Now, our CPA case is in ethics and governance, for example, is a page of about one and a half pages of reading. Often in CPA exam, you have three pages of reading, so it's even longer. Lots of red herrings and confusion and, and items like that. So exam technique, you're in the exam and I, at the start of tonight I talked about five big failures. So read the information, read the question. A lot of people are nervous, their heart rate is up, they're panicking and they skim read it and then they jump to an answer before they've read the question. So what you do, you say to yourself, read the question. Calm yourself down, take a deep breath before each question, read, read it really slowly. And, and there's nothing wrong with that panic feeling. It's human nature. You are being held accountable in three and a quarter hours for a whole semester's worth of work. The pressure is on. So read it and then note the key words. Bit tricky on a computer screen, but is, is the word most accurate or least likely or not? Look for the negatives in the words. What is the question asking for? Because the distractors are designed to take you in the wrong direction. For example, management accounting. I might ask you to calculate the break-even point, but the first step in getting a break-even point is to calculate a contribution margin, right, per unit. My first answer, A, will probably be a contribution margin per unit, and half the people, oh, yeah, 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 they only remember, oh, yeah, yeah, better do, oh, that number looks right, because it looks, and, and they confuse contribution margin with break-even because they haven't noted the key words, and that's when the problems take place. All right, hi Alex, I can't help you right now. I'm in the middle of a webinar. Um, please message the inquiries mailbox. I'll see what uh, they can do to help. Uh, you, you might be able to highlight in the questions and keywords in the CPA exam, what you need to do there is check out, they have a, in my mind learning, what it's like to do the exam experience. So from there, what we've got is, think of the answer first. So what we, the one problem with A, B, C, D is lots of people try and read those options and go, oh, which one's right, which one's right. But the best thing to do, especially if it's tax or financial reporting, don't look at the answers, see if you can figure it out. And then when you look at the options, you can be very confident you found the correct one. So do your best to get the answer first and don't uh, use the, the A, B, C, D to trigger your memory because there's tricks and traps highlighted there. Check each option carefully. Um, one of the great ways we used to trap people, I'm, I'm now on your team, but in the old days I was on the CPA team, and, and we're not nasty, but we have to write really good distractors to, to make sure you really know the answer. So what we would do is we would make option A look pretty good, and then option B pretty good, and, and then look, if the correct answer was D, you might have already picked A, because it looked so appealing, before you even read right down to the bottom of the options. So that's a simple mistake that you can avoid. And what I actually recommend to people to do, start at the bottom, and read upwards. It's kind of weird, but what it does is if you go D, C, B, A, it forces you to read every option carefully. Yes, it's uh, recorded again. So if you've, if you've missed out, it'll be recorded. We'll have it published by midnight tonight. Jump forward quickly. Now, the reality is 80% of people listening to me tonight will ignore this because it, it's impossible to do it. They just can't. You're not being naughty or disobedient. It just, you want to get the answer right. But if you've got a question that you don't know the answer to, and it's going to take you six or eight or 10 minutes to answer, then you shouldn't answer it. You should jump forward to all the questions you can answer. And then if you have time left over at the end, go back and do it. But what happens is you will waste 10 minutes on a question you don't know, maybe get it wrong, and miss out on five questions that you do know. Now, this is human behavior, but if you cannot force yourself to jump forward quickly, then even if you, the, the worst situation, some students fail a CPA exam because they haven't done enough work, but others fail even though they've done all the work. They know the study guide. I talk to them on the phone, they know it inside out, but they get into the exam, they get stuck in a few questions, 30 minutes disappears, and you, you have to be disciplined. So have the clock, and I'll actually go through the timings in just a minute. Watch the clock and tell yourself it is okay to jump forward quickly. Even put it on a post-it note. Yeah, option D and upwards. Right, we have all these mechanisms to shortcut the panic in your brain because, it, that, and that's why we have two practice exams, to just 
desensitize you to that panic. So that by the time you get to CPA exam, you're used to sitting down for that period of time working through all the options. Someone's just written, yeah, cannot take a chance to lose one mark. It always holds you back. That's right, you have to say. And, and this is why people miss out on the written response because one mark versus 25 marks. It, it, it's heartbreaking when I see someone miss out on a written answer when I know they know the answers, but they just didn't have time to write it. It's so frustrating because it means you've worked so hard all semester, but you haven't been rewarded for that effort. Um, so now with the guessing of the answers in the old days with psychology, we B and C were normally the ones you should always guess, but it's randomised now and CPA structure their answers in order of length. So just guess what you could normally cross out one or two options, but and then you'll be stuck with two and then you've got to guess. So if you are running out of um, time, then yeah, you need to guess. So flag the ones you don't know, do the ones you can do, then go back to the others. And if you've got a guess, try and eliminate one or two options and then go from there. Uh, someone said, choose the three most correct options. In this. Usually it's A, B, C or D, um, definitely not the three most correct options, but what they can use is a, what's called a K-type distractor. So you can have piece of information one, two, and three, and then option A might be um, one and two are correct, or one and three are correct. So that's a way they can give you that type of question. They're not supposed to have any of those questions. It's, they're not very fair, but they've got them. They're supposed to eliminate them one day. So here's GSL. Few people are asking, what, what should you do with GSL and what's the pass mark? Now, we can't give you a, a scaled score analysis because no one's done this GSL exam before with CPA. It's a new type of exam with lots of MCQs, hardly any written. So yeah, that, that's really weird in my mind learning to have that type of option. The exams don't do that um, to, to my knowledge in anywhere else. So this is our recommendation for, for GSL, 45 minutes, uh, for the case vignettes, 105 minutes for the general MCQs and 45 minutes for the written response. And we are finding students are doing the general stuff first, then the cases, then the written. Even they're doing it out of order to the way we structured the paper and most students are running out of time. Uh, the average mark is, is quite low, around about 40 out of 80. We're still trying to build up what's the average and what's the estimated stale score. Uh, it's not a silly question. CPA have never published a pass mark. Uh, so it could be 30%, could be 60, 70%. Um, they used to say that it was 60 to 65% roughly, but they never actually published it. So ENG, you're going to get 85 marks, roughly 2.3 marks per minute, 60 multi choice, 25 marks of written. So you need to spend, we say, two minutes per multiple choice, two hours, one hour for written. Now, one hour for written is a lot of time for 25 marks, but you have to read three pages. It's going to take you 20 or 30 minutes just to read it, then type some things. And that gives you a 15 minute safety buffer. <coughs> and someone's just written, aim for 65%. Totally agree. Go for 65. SMA, same as ENG. Two minutes per multiple choice. So you should be timing yourself. After 15 multiple choice, you should be at the 30 minute mark. If you're not, you need to start jumping ahead on the difficult ones. You must not fall behind because it's so easy. The difference between two minutes on a multiple choice and three minutes, it, it's only 60 seconds. If you're concentrating hard, 60 seconds disappears like this. And that is the difference between getting zero on your written and getting 10, 15 or 20 marks. So two minutes per mark, not three minutes per mark. Uh, for the multiple choice question. It's as disciplined as that. You cannot spend that extra uh, minute. Can you mark questions on the practice exam? No, you just have to, but, but it doesn't have a tick next to it. So if you don't, so every practice exam question that you click an answer on, it will have a green tick. So if you keep going down and you just move to the next question, it will be blank. So you know which ones to go back to and fill in. FR, 45 MCQs, three minutes per question. Now, some of them will be tough and tricky and have journal entries. You might need four or five minutes, but be very, very careful not to fall behind here. Now, here are the electives. A little bit easier to get the timings right. Sometimes a question can be much 
will take four minutes or five minutes and others will take one or two. So they'll balance out. But what you have to do is every 15 minutes, check your progress. So in a tax exam, you know, you need to be doing seven or eight questions every 15 minutes. After half an hour, you should be you know, moving along. So by the end of one and a half hours, you're up to the 30 question mark. Otherwise, you are falling behind. FRM, CBI, audit. Audit, you only get about two minutes a mark. Uh, SMA definitely, I, I think an index works, especially when there are lots of fancy definitions or formulas, so module three and module five. Please be very disciplined. Now, please use the practice exams to get disciplined here. And if you find your behavior is moving towards not skipping, force yourself, break the mental habit because you, you will get rewarded for doing the right thing. All right. So I hope I've encouraged you. Some of you will still struggle because you're fighting against natural tendency. Don't, don't beat yourself up. Don't get upset at yourself. It's just what it is, but just do your best to improve. Um, simple calculator might be okay. Any, you need to be able to do any question that's already in the financial reporting study guide. So if a simple calculator works for that, great. Otherwise use a financial calculator. With the countdown time, I, I don't know if it's uh, hours, minutes, or just minutes. Um, how long for reading the GSL case study? We don't know how long it is, but I'm saying 45 minutes for 12 marks. That includes reading and writing your answers. So I would assume 20 minutes of reading, 20 minutes of writing, but we don't. We actually don't know. Uh, what are the chances of having a case study from highly weighted modules? It, it, CPA have different questions for different. In, in GSL, for example, you might get one on module four. Someone else gets a question on module six. Um, in ethics and governance, it can cover the whole study guide. Ethics, governance, trade practices, law, um, corporate accountability, financial reporting, the same. Um, I personally think you should do the case study first because if you write nothing, guaranteed zero. But then you have to have the discipline to jump back to the MCQs after 30 or 45 minutes and do that. So now my brother Russell, he did the CPA exam after me. He actually got better marks than me. And he always says, do the multiple choice first, then the case study. You have to find out what suits you best. So maybe in the practice exam, try it one way, try the other, and see which makes you feel most comfortable. So how do the scale scores work? What we've been doing is looking at people's uh, results on our practice exams, comparing that to the scale scores they send through at the end of the semester, and comparing the, the two. As Fiona's just written, do your case study when your brain's fresh. I totally agree with that. If you start the case study after two and a half hours, you're tired, you're exhausted, you're reading all this complicated information, I think do it fresh, get something written down, even 20 or 30 minutes, and then get to the multiple choice and add more later if you've got some time left. Yeah, the FR exam's moving to more like drag and drop and no written answer, but it's still uh, 40, I think 45 MCQs, 20, 20 marks are written. Uh, if you do well on MCQ but run out of time to do the written, we'll have the pass. No, there is no pass mark per section. It's just a total score. And if you get zero on the written, you're most likely will fail the paper. That, that's just how CPA works. So this exam is out of 65. If you get below 20 on our practice exam, you will normally get a, a score below 500 scale score. So the passing scale score is 540. So. Uh, Yes, uh, they do change the papers most semesters and they rearrange them. They write, we used to write brand new questions and case studies every single semester plus new questions because people talk and they share and, and all the rest. Uh, no, no, it's not too late to do the practice exams. All right, I'm going to talk about scaled scores for a minute. So I'm happy to answer scaled score questions, all the other questions if they could wait. Uh, 20 to 25 out of 65 on, on fail. Now, this is the tricky area. 26 to 29, most people do not get through. Um, 30 to 35, most people do, but not everyone. So what's the simple solution? The simple solution is to make sure you can get about 40 to 43 out of 65. Then you can be a whole lot more comfortable. Um, the whole exam is out of 900, yes. That's the scale score. The scale score is between 100 and 900. So it's not if you get 540, that is not just a calculation like a percentage of what you got. That is just your scaled weighting score. I'm going to go through each subject one after the other. All right, audit. And, and we email these out to everyone as well, so I hope this helps. But with audit, uh, 
fail is less than 48 out of 90. So a little bit higher than 50%. Pretty much anyone who got below 48 didn't make it through. So you could be that one person and that's great. We want to encourage you, study hard, keep improving. But less than 48 means you know roughly only half the 10 and you will struggle to get a pass. So if you are if you get less than 48 and it's really close to your exam, you can consider a deferral. Yes, it's expensive, it's $450. But if you don't think you'll get through, then my encouragement to you is uh, better to defer and attack it again next semester. So borderline fails, uh, 48 to 53. And there's, it's actually a really unusual subject. If you get 54 out of 90, half the students get through, half don't. So really, really, really want to get, even 55 to 57 is mostly make it, but don't always make it. It's a bit like the, the Serengeti where the, um, the herds have to cross the river and the crocodiles are there. Most get through, but but some don't. That's, that's a terrible metaphor, but that's what I'm thinking. But this is where the, the confident level can, you know, you want to be getting, I'm pretty much saying get 60 out of 90, average of 66% and you're on track. CBI, uh, less than 53 out of, and someone was asking, are our exams easier or harder? Now you can see from this, CBI, 80 questions, but 40 is not the pass mark. We're saying you need 53 out of 80 as a bare, Minimum. So we would say we need quite a lot more than than 50%. And that's just the way it, it weights. Uh, 40, 54 to 58, dangerous territory. Get yourself above 66 and you can be confident of doing really well. Um, yes, in ENG, a case will often have multiple modules. It'll, it can have three, four and five. It can have an ethics issue, a trade practices and a governance issue all mixed together. Yeah, it can be quite complicated. Um, it's not fair that some get through while others don't. Um, one of the reasons why, um, so this is an interesting one. Sometimes in CBI, one student will get 58 and get a high distinction and someone else will get 58 and get a low fail. And, and a bit of that is that both students know the study guide well, but in their exam, one of them used good technique, jumped ahead, managed their time and the other one got caught up and maybe didn't answer the last 10 or 15 or just had to guess them all. So panic and pressure and stress have a huge influence on your result. Whereas when you do our practice exam, that, that panic and stress isn't, yeah, the stomach ache kicks in. Um, I, for me, the tax exam was the hardest by far. I felt like my brain was gonna explode. It, I tried to think quickly. The harder I tried to think, the more it felt like I was trying to think in the middle of a dream. It was, it was really, really stressful. But SMA for me, everything just made perfect sense. So that's why different students can get a, a different result. So tax exam, our exam is very tough compared to the CPA exam. And we find that most people who get just over half, you know, 33 out of 60, get a distinction or a high distinction. So it's very, very hard to get above 36 on our tax paper out of 60. Less than 21, normally a fail. So here we're saying that 35 to 40% on our practice exam is normally enough to just scrape it through. 40% to 50 is okay. Um, you, uh, someone said, you can only attempt it once. And there's no point attempting it again because our, our questions are different to the CPA questions. So we're just testing your exam ability and your knowledge of the content. But the, the study guides are over 500 pages long. So the chances of us getting the exact same question is slim. What it means is if you don't score enough, you've got more content to learn and more exam technique to, to improve. And if you've got two or three weeks up your sleeve, you should be able to make it. Um, see how that goes. So if you do 30 questions right for tax, generally, I think pretty much any student who scored 30 or above in tax in the last couple of semesters passed the CPA exam. Um, yeah, I'm really confident on that. And the figures on the slides here in marks or percentage, these are marks out of the, um, whatever the exam. So tax is out of 60. So I'm saying if you get 20, less than 21 out of 60, you're not gonna get through tax. Uh, yes, for advanced tax, you get an immediate result because um, it's multiple choice, you get all the answers and all the explanations. FRM, uh, 40, da, 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 da. so get above 60 and you're on track for a distinction or a high distinction. That's that's pretty much how it works. Less than 40 is, is not so strong. SMA, uh, less than 48, not very likely chance of making it through. Uh, strong pass is 62 to 65. Now, you can see that's out of 85. So you've got to get a good 75%, three quarters of the questions right. That's what we expect. 
And then if you want an HD, you've got to get a huge amount of our paper correct. All right. Uh, do you get immediate result for CPI? Yes, any multiple choice exam, you get, for any multiple choice question, you get the answer immediately uh, and you get your results straight away. Uh, multi choice questions in AT, a combination of more than one module, they can be, but not usually. That would be <laughs> pretty complicated. It might be because first half of tax, modules one to five, is concepts, and then module six to 10 is how those concepts apply. So module six might be on individuals. Module two is on accessible income, module three is on deductions. So then in module six, you're doing accessible income and deductions, module two and three, and how they link to individuals. So that's where the, the overlap is with tax. The GSL pass mark. Now last semester, the pass mark, we had 75% was guaranteed pass, if you got above that. Um, but we haven't established a GSL one yet because no one sat the paper. Uh, no one's seen how tricky the CPA paper is, but our one seems to be quite difficult. So we're we're thinking about 40 out of 80 is the GSL pass mark, but I can't figure that out. When do the results come out? From CPA, they come out in mid-December. Um, but with us, yeah, we get you get from us immediately with the written response in four days and uh, <coughs> CPA six or eight weeks. Um, any further feedback after the end? No, you don't need, all the feedback is written. After each answer, it tells you what you got right or wrong and it explains each one so you can check it straight away. Does the difficulty of the exam get depend on whether you do it early or later? No. If you do it early or later, according to CPA, they don't care because you get the, you can get the PDF study guide earlier. So even though some people get an extra two weeks, what, what most people do is they, they just start studying later. If your exam's early, you start studying earlier. So they don't do that. Why do CPA publish figures to yourself such a high percentage? Um, that, that's just linked to the scale score and they call it a competent student. So if you, they work out the minimum level of competence and that's the pass mark. So one exam, the pass mark, if they say in tax that you're competent at 40%, that can be the pass mark. Anyone above that passes. So they don't use a bell curve. They don't draw a curve of all the students' results and then say, oh, here's the pass. What they do is they say, okay, what does a competent CPA who's done the tax subject look like? And if they put the line there, then everyone above that line passes and everyone below doesn't. But if they put the line up here, that's that's how it decides. So one exam, that's why with ethics and governance, 40% roughly fail. Financial reporting used to be up at about 48%. GSL is closer to 22, 23%. Um, at the moment, we can't do a breakdown of marks per module. That's We're, we're investing in that for 2018. We hope that our, the, the reports you get from us will be more and more detailed. Uh, I don't understand why GSL appears so much harder. Yeah, look, GSL is a much trickier exam. It's, it's been totally different to all the other subjects, so it stresses people out, but the fail rate's been under 25% for quite a while. So SMA, FR, tax, all, all of them are, more people fail. I think because of GSL, they, um, they panic, but they work a lot harder. Uh, so you book the practice exams. Yes, you can push the dates out. You don't need to reschedule. Just jump in and see them when you're ready. Uh, can you have feedback on K's practice exams for the multiple choice? Yes, there's feedback in every single question. Every question has a detailed explanation. So that's what we mean by the, the feedback. Um, so I hope that helps. In the ENG cases, questions mention some keywords for us to search and locate. It, it should be crystal clear. If it's an ethics issue, module two governance, things like corporate governance, boards of directors, that's module three. Trade practices law, um, abuse of the market, that's module four. four. Corporate accountability, that's module five. Um, so CPA published figures do not relate to the percentage. Yeah, they do publish the percentage of candidates passing. That's right, that's what I'm saying. With GSL, um, about 75, 76% of students pass. The fail rate's about 24%. That is not a published pass mark, it's how many students pass. So, um, Connie, if you mentioned about GSL, email me and, and we'll talk you through. We're still analysing the stats as students sit the paper to work out what the average is and, and what's normal. Uh, are the past exams published? No, CPA don't publish past exams. Uh, for SMA, if we miss the written questions, do we, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Uh, do you pass? Probably not. Uh, because you can, you might if you've got perfect score on your MCQs, but it's very, very risky. Most people who don't um, do the written section fail the exam. So uh, 
Yeah, the past might actually not be relevant. Yeah, but it's, it's nice to know. That's why you, you've seen with our pledge approach, we always get uh, encourage people to pledge to that distinction, high distinction. Um, yeah, CPA used to publish the amount of students who sat the exam. CPA had been misbehaving for a couple of years. You might have seen that, the CEO being removed. And uh, one of the things they stopped doing was proper disclosure and reporting. They've been very selective and massaging the numbers. Um, what about FRM? I published FRM uh, just before. So there's FRM. Uh, does CPA have a target number for students that pass? No, it's based on competence level. Uh, the readings in most are not examinable unless it's specified, so virtually no readings are examinable, but the appendixes are definitely examinable. All right, so I've gone for over an hour already, so I don't want to take up too much of your time, but the key things I want to encourage for you just before I finish. Uh, it, normally four working days is what we do, um, but you can email us and we'll see if we can and mark that in time for you. Before your exam, plan your time, prepare an index, and uh, just some things. So highlight, write notes, tag. In an exam, you want to be able to quickly turn to the right page. Here's an example of uh, Russell. He did the paper in about 2009. Uh, he got uh, straight high distinctions and a perfect score for tax. He won two subject prizes and the overall CPA prize for the best student out of about 20,000 students in 2009. So that tagging worked. It took him a lot of time, though. So is there any restriction on the material? No, if it's written, you can take it in, but your desk isn't going to be very big. Uh, so that pretty much takes me to the end of my formal part of the night. So I want to say thank you very much for attending. I'm going to stick around for a good 10 minutes, 15 minutes, because there's a lot of questions still coming. So if you want to follow up on uh, the scaled scores and everything. Yeah, Russell did pretty well. So he started working for Knowledge Equity and then he was he studied finance and worked in investment banking. So he had to come back and do accounting. And he, uh, so he had to do three subjects in each semester while working full time. And he, he's a machine, he's very, very talented. So if, if you feel like I've answered, I hope I've given you some good tips. I hope when you practice our exams, you, you use these techniques, jump forward, watch your clock, be really disciplined, take deep breaths. And that's worth quite a few marks. If, if you make sure you get something written down, then, then I've done my job and I wish you all the best. Um, if you have the QRI and you prefer that, then you don't need to tag. So I, a friend of mine did the CPA um, with me. He never wrote highlighters or tagging. He, he studies different to me. I highlight and write summary notes, Russell tags. Everyone has their strategy. Yeah, he did three subjects in the semester. He's, he's pretty freaky. Um, but, and just he works very, very hard. All right, so now the other thing, if you if you do have, um, yeah, someone said, why tagging if you've got QRI? You, uh, I think I answered that. You don't need to um, tag. Yeah, I finally got my voice back after three weeks. So that's a, a little bit terrifying. Um, yeah, the, the tags like Russell's make people feel very intimidated when you walk into the exam because I think, oh, I haven't done that. I hope that's, that's going to work. All right, now if you've had during the day problems with your practice exam, um, when because our website went down for a couple of hours so number one uh, my apologies that's very disruptive on a Sunday afternoon just before exams so we're doing our best to fix it we've upgraded our server we don't know if that's the solution but we will just keep doing our best um, we will if your exam paper needs to be reset we're doing that it's going to take hours there's hundreds of papers to get in and manually climb in the back end and reset but we will message you and we will get that working uh, and all the best with your studies this week and everything else. Cool, and I'll monitor the chat box, but otherwise, have a great night. Cheers. Someone asked, can we do the practice exams tonight? And we could say um, yes, yes to that, but